Hi friends, most of you watch my channel without subscribing. Please subscribe if you like my stories. Have a good rest. My name is Jack, and I never imagined I'd find myself in a situation like this. For the past five years, I've been married to a woman I thought I knew. A woman I thought loved me as much as I loved her. But it turns out my wife, Alyssa, has been living a double life and cheating on me for most of our relationship. I uncovered her betrayal in the most painful way possible, catching her in the act with my own eyes when I came home early one day. In that moment, my whole world collapsed around me. The life I thought I had, the woman I thought I shared it with, was all an illusion. Here is the full story of how I uncovered my wife's affair, found the courage to take back my life, and came through this ordeal stronger. Part 1. Discovering the Affair I first sensed something might be off in my marriage to Lissa about six months ago. She started frequently texting and sneaking off to take private calls. When I asked who she was talking to, she'd get evasive and say it was just a girlfriend from work or her sister. Lissa also began working late more often, always with some reasonable sounding excuse. I tried not to be paranoid or seem accusatory. After all, we'd been happily married for five years and together for two before that. We were even talking about starting a family soon. I had no real proof anything inappropriate was going on. But my gut told me something wasn't right. A distance grew between us. Alyssa became less affectionate and seemed to pull away emotionally. Our sex life tapered off. When I tried to get to the root of what was troubling her, she insisted she was just stressed at work. I started noticing other odd behaviours too. Alyssa began meticulously hiding her phone from me and became jittery whenever I entered a room unexpectedly. It was like she was trying to conceal some secret life from me. One weekend I had to unexpectedly travel for a work conference. When I got home a day early, I found Alyssa frantically stashing luggage in our closet. She claimed she had decided to cram in a quick girls' trip while I was away. But her anxious demeanour seemed suspect. A few weeks later, I faked having to go on another work trip. I suspected Alyssa was taking advantage of my absences to sneak around behind my back. So instead of getting on my flight, I parked down the street from our house and waited to see what she would do. Sure enough, just an hour after I was supposed to have left for the airport, a flashy sports car pulled into our driveway. To my dismay, I saw Alyssa run out to embrace the driver, a man I recognize as Eric, an old friend of hers. As they kissed passionately on the doorstep, my worst suspicions were confirmed. Alyssa was having an affair. Over the next few days, I withdrew into myself trying to process this devastating discovery. I confided in my close friend Darren, who helped talk me off a ledge. As much as I wanted to confront Alyssa right away, I knew I needed proof before making any accusations. So I went into surveillance mode. I installed hidden cameras around the house to monitor Alyssa's activities. I put tracking apps on her devices. I even followed her, learning she and Eric were meeting several times a week at a motel across town. The evidence against her mounted. After two agonizing months of spying on my own wife, I had seen enough. The photo and video proof I had gathered left no room for excuses. It was time to initiate the end of my marriage and bring Alyssa's web of lies crashing down. Part 2. Confrontation On the morning, I planned to confront Alyssa about her affair. I felt like I was in a daze. I went through the motions, showering, dressing, eating breakfast. On the outside, I tried to act normal. Inside, I was screaming. I called out of work, claiming a family emergency. I knew this coming showdown would be draining and wanted time to process whatever went down. Around 9 a.m., I texted Alyssa asking if she could meet me at home on her lunch break to talk about something important. She replied quickly agreeing to be there at noon. Those next three hours crawling by. I paced around the house rehearsing what I would say, trying unsuccessfully to calm my swirling mind. At 11.45, I poured myself a stiff drink, took a deep breath and waited. Right on time, Alyssa walked through the front door greeting me cheerfully. That smile quickly faded when she saw the expression on my face and the suitcase sitting by the door. What's going on? She asked worriedly. I cut right to the chase. I know about Eric. I know you've been cheating on me for months. 
It's over Alyssa. Her face went white. She started stuttering denials, but I silenced her by forcefully sliding the folder of evidence across the table. Don't bother lying about it anymore. I have all the proof right here. I saw you with my own eyes too. My voice was eerily calm but lying the tempest inside. Alyssa collapsed into a chair and burst into tears. I'm so sorry, Jack. I never wanted you to find out this way. We have to talk about this, she choked out. I shook my head in disgust. Talk about what? How you betrayed me? Made a fool of me? What could you possibly say to make this better? She reached for my hand pleadingly. It didn't mean anything, Jack. I love you. I was just confused for a while. But we can get through this. I recoiled from her touch. Do not give me that bull's asterisk asterisked. I snapped. This wasn't confusion. It was a choice you made for months to lie and sneak around behind my back. I will never forgive you for this. Alyssa's desperation quickly flipped to indignation. So what? You're just going to throw away everything we've built over one mistake. I think you're completely overreacting. Plenty of couples work through infidelity. Her audacity left me momentarily speechless. I wanted to shake her out of this delusion that I would entertain in reconciling after what she'd done. Let me make this clear, I said. This sham of a marriage is over. You will sign the divorce papers my lawyer has already drawn up. The only conversation we'll be having is sorting out the practicalities of separating our lives. Save your excuses and apologies. I don't want to hear them. Alyssa glared at me defiantly. You don't get to just dictate terms to me. I'm not signing anything until we properly discuss this. I deserve that much. I scoffed derisively. You deserve nothing from me, but I'm done wasting breath on you. I left her fuming at the table and went to pack up the remainder of my essential belongings. Before walking out the door, I turned to Alyssa one last time. I'll be sending movers next week to collect the rest of my things. My lawyer will be in touch about the paperwork. Do not contact me for any other reason. I'm sure she shouted something as I left, but I drowned it out cranking up music in my car. As I sped away, I let the rage and sadness wash over me. I had done what I needed to. The hard part was over. A new life awaited, without the woman who had so deeply wounded me. Part 3. Picking up the pieces. In the first few weeks after leaving Alyssa, I was consumed with handling all the logistics of separating my life from hers. Between meeting with lawyers, finding a new apartment, retrieving my belongings, and untangling our finances, I didn't have much time to process my grief. I threw myself into the tasks at hand and worked myself to exhaustion each day to avoid facing the pain. But at night, when things grew quiet, the sorrow and anger I had suppressed would come flooding to the surface. I drank too much and unleashed my rage by destroying any reminders of Alyssa, old love notes, gifts from our anniversaries, wedding photos. My only comfort during this dark time was my buddy Darren. It was a pillar of strength, helping me through many drunken meltdowns and indulging my moodiness. I was eternally grateful I had such a loyal friend to lean on when my whole world collapsed. After about a month, I started to shift out of crisis mode and into building a new life for myself. I reconnected with old friends, pursued hobbies I'd neglected, and adopted a dog named Lucky who brought much needed laughter into my days. I had decided not to share details on social media about my separation, but word spread quickly through the grapevine. They most offered their support, so Melissa's circle took her side. They blamed me for not trying hard enough to work things out. This only reinforced my conviction that cutting ties completely was the right call. Anyone willing to justify Alyssa's despicable behavior was no real friend to me. I declined to engage in drama or defend myself, silently pruning people out of my life. In this lonely time, the one bright spot was reconnecting with my son Liam, who I had from a previous relationship. He and Alyssa never got along, so the divorce hardly fazed him. If anything, it brought us closer. I tried to see Liam more frequently, which was a challenge with his mother Lisa living in another state. He never pried for details on the split. We focused instead on making the most of our time doing activities we both enjoyed. 
It brought me joy when I needed it most. By the six-month mark post-separation, I finally started to regain my equilibrium. I missed Alyssa less and less each day. My anger toward her diminished indifference. She was no longer part of my story. I threw myself into advancing my career, rediscovered old passions and traveled more. Slowly but surely, I rebuilt the foundation of my life into something meaningful again, something that belonged wholly to me. Part 4. Serving Papers Nearly a year had passed since I moved out and initiated divorce proceedings against Alyssa. I was content focusing on my healing journey, then she trying to railroad me into a reconciliation. Out of the blue one day, Alyssa called insisting we meet to talk. She ambushed me with teary apologies and pleas to seek couples counselling, saying she had ended things with Eric and finally understood the devastation she had caused. I shut down her rambling, making clear I had no interest in therapy or restarting our relationship. I had closed the book on our marriage the day I walked out, but Alyssa refused to take no for an answer, continuing her crusade to sway me via texts, emails and voicemails. Having kept my cool for months, I finally lost it. I told Alyssa in no uncertain terms that she needed to sign the damn divorce papers my lawyer had sent months ago and stop pursuing me before she forced my hand. Maybe it was unfair, but I couldn't help feeling a flash of satisfaction seeing the shock register on her face when I threatened legal action. She had grown accustomed to walking all over me. That dynamic ended the day I uncovered her affair. My strong stance clearly shook Alyssa. But after her initial surprise, she turned to fight again. You don't get to bully me into signing anything until we have a conversation, man to man, she challenged. I almost had to laugh at her audacity. If she expected me to politely indulge this discussion after everything, Alyssa was even more delusional than I realized. Her patronizing attempt at controlling me again was the last straw. If she refused to sign the papers willingly, I would make sure she couldn't ignore them. A few weeks later was our seventh wedding anniversary. I knew Alyssa would expect me to acknowledge it in some way, though we had been separated for months. It was time for me to send a message. I had the divorce documents professionally printed and bound in the form of a book. I then gift-wrapped them with an anniversary card on top that reads, Signed, Sealed, Delivered. Here's to our final chapter. Was it petty and dramatic? Maybe. But it felt good finally asserting myself after being stepped on throughout our marriage and divorce proceedings. I had the papers express courier to Alyssa's job for maximum impact. She was livid, judging by the tirade of outraged voicemails she left me. But my point had been made, she signed and returned the documents within a week. I know our relationship had to end after her betrayal. But watching Alyssa's signature drying on those divorce papers still stung. After all, saying goodbye to a life you once thought was perfect is never easy, no matter the circumstances. Part 5. Focusing on Fatherhood With my marriage finally dissolved and Alyssa out of my system, I shifted focus to the other most important relationship in my life, being a dad to my son Liam. We had grown closer than ever through my divorce. Now, I wanted to make up for lost time and be the father he deserved. I went to court to petition for joint custody of Liam. There was never any doubt I would share equal parenting rights with his mother, Lisa. I hired an aggressive lawyer anyway to show her I was serious about being in Liam's life. To my relief, there was no battle. Lisa recognized that Liam needed his dad, especially now with me less distracted by my failed marriage. We cordially agreed on shared custody, allowing Liam to split time evenly between both households. I traded in my sports car for something more family-friendly and relocated to a neighborhood with better schools. My new place had an extra bedroom where I encouraged Liam to decorate and make his own. I wanted him to truly feel at home with me, not like he was just visiting on weekends. We fell into a comfortable routine when Liam was staying over. I took him to soccer practice in the evenings and helped with homework. We cooked breakfast together before school. On weekends we went hiking, played video games, watched movies, or just tossed a baseball around the backyard. I realized how much I had missed by letting my marital issues sideline me from being there for Liam during his formative years. But I vowed to make up for lost time 
I'd give him my full focus now. With Alyssa no longer a factor, I also made an effort to ensure Liam still had relationships with other relatives on her side he was close to, like his Aunt Claire. Liam was always my priority, not any leftover antagonism toward my ex. A year later, when Liam nervously confided that he had a crush on a girl in his science class, I knew I had succeeded in becoming the confident he could turn to as he navigated adolescence. Despite the pain of my failed marriage, I was grateful it brought Liam into my daily life. Father had gave me purpose and joy when I needed it most. Thanks to him, the future looked a little brighter. Part 6. Betrayed Again In the two years since my life imploded, I had finally regained some sense of normalcy. My divorce from Alyssa was finalised, my career was advancing nicely, and being an involved father to Liam kept me busy and fulfilled. Just when I thought the dust had settled, I learned my so-called best friend Darren had betrayed me as deeply as Alyssa, and I discovered the affair may have been going on behind my back for longer than her infidelity. Darren was the supposed loyal buddy who helped me through the trauma of catching Alyssa cheating. I had considered him family. We were inseparable since college. That's why running into Darren having dinner with Alyssa one evening completely blindsided me. They both looked mortified as I stood frozen, the colour draining from their faces. Alyssa quickly stammered some excuse about discussing divorce paperwork before hurrying out. Darren begged me not to jump to conclusions but I saw everything I needed to in their guilty expressions. The extent of their duplicity was confirmed when I gained access to Alyssa's phone records and emails. They had been carrying on since before our separation. This whole time I thought Darren had my back, he was sleeping with my wife behind it. I was gutted realizing nearly everyone close to me was living a double life that I knew nothing about. How could I have been so oblivious? In hindsight, all the signs were there, unexplained absences, dodging questions about their friendship. I just trusted Darren too much to imagine he could deceive me. To avoid further headaches, I cut contact completely with both of them. Darren bombarded me pleading to explain and save our friendship. But I'd blocked his number and refused to engage. As far as I was concerned, nothing he could say would justify his betrayal. Losing my closest confidant hurt almost as much as Alyssa's duplicity. The two people I should have been able to count on most had been lying to me for who knows how long. My trust in people suffered a massive blow. I was more guarded and cynical, which unfortunately strained some of my other friendships. I hated feeling unable to take people at their word, constantly looking for ulterior motives. But the experience had left me with deep wounds that time alone could heal. If I had any lingering temptation to reconcile with Alyssa, Darren's involvement extinguished that. Any shred of positive regard for her, I clung to was gone. I knew without question that completely removing Alyssa from my life forever was the only path forward. Her affair had broken my heart, but the willful deceit by someone I considered a brother crushed what remained of my spirit. It was the ultimate betrayal. I knew I would carry the scars from it for a long time. As I spiraled into depression again, my lifeline was my son Liam. Being responsible for him gave me purpose on my darkest days. I never let my personal struggles negatively impact his life, always keeping our time together positive. When I had nothing else, I still had my boy who relied on me. My all-consuming focus on being the best father possible was the only thing that prevented me from sinking into despair during that period. Liam saved me without even realizing it. Part 7. A Fresh Start Nearly three years after catching Alyssa cheating set off an agonizing chain reaction in my life, I finally felt ready to leave the past behind and start fresh. My son Liam and I were both thriving from our shared custody arrangement. My career had fully rebounded, and thanks to much reflection and counseling, I made peace with what happened. I decided a change of scenery was in order for the next chapter. Liam was eager for an adventure too before starting high school, so we moved across the country to California for my exciting new job opportunity. The sunny West Coast vibe was the perfect antidote to years of gloom. Liam and I explored our new hometown with vigor, hiking the coastal trails, discovering hole-in-the-wall restaurants, strolling the beach boardwalk on weekends. 
The regular routine we had established continued smoothly even with this major relocation. At work, I let my reputation speak for itself, instead of being defined by office gossip about my disastrous marriage. I kept to myself socially and didn't rush into dating again. After so much emotional whiplash, I was content being on my own for the foreseeable future. In my personal life, I broke the pattern of befriending colleagues. I joined a community basketball league and met grounded, relatable guys who shared my interests. Keeping work and leisure separate brought much needed balance. I'd also rekindled my passion for travel, taking Liam on epic road trips during school breaks. Our adventures exploring national parks and obscure tourist attractions deepened our bond. I wanted him to view the world through a lens of wonder, creating memories we cherished long after these trips ended. With each passing month in my adopted new home, the painful chapters of my past faded further out of focus. The hurt and anger that consumed me for so long after Alyssa's betrayal lifted like a heavy fog. I was filled with new optimism and excitement for the journey ahead, whatever direction it took me. For the first time in forever, the possibilities seemed endless. I was captain of my own destiny again, wiser for the storms I had weathered, with an amazing kid by my side. Some days were still a struggle, but focusing on the joys in front of me kept me moving forward to a brighter future. Part 8. Unfinished Business My new life in California had brought peace of mind after years of inner turmoil surrounding my failed marriage. Lion was thriving under my full-time care. At work, I was up for a major promotion, and I had even cautiously begun dating a colleague named Becca who made me laugh like nobody had in ages. Just as everything seemed to be on track, Alyssa resurfaced out of nowhere delivering shocking news. She had been diagnosed with advanced terminal cancer. With only months left, she wanted us to mend fences. I was tempted to ignore her plea, but there were unresolved issues between us that I didn't want haunting me. I decided we owed each other one last honest conversation for mental closure. When we met at a quiet diner, the anger that used to ignite at the sight of Alyssa barely flickered. Time and distance had tempered those hot-blooded reactions, leaving only calm reflection. I told Alyssa I wished her no ill, but couldn't offer the absolution she seemed to crave. She accepted that with resignation and agreed my resentments were justified. We both acknowledged mistakes made. Her looming end put everything in stark perspective. Alyssa said she needed to tell me one last thing that weighed on her. During our marriage, she had terminated a pregnancy. The child was likely either mine or Darren's. She apologized for denying me the knowledge that I might have another son or daughter out there. Though rocked by this news, I kept my composure. I chose not to delve into whose baby it might have been or the implications of her decision. That would serve no constructive purpose now. We sat in loaded silence for several minutes. Finally, I told Alyssa despite everything. I sincerely hoped she could find some peace in her remaining days. She tearfully thanked me for my graciousness given our history. We parted ways for the last time. I mean to the city for hours processing the gravity of what Alyssa told me. I was saddened for the child whose existence was cut short under such awful circumstances. But harboring resentment would only poison my present happiness. That night I cradled baby photos of Liam, remembering when he first entered my world. However flawed Alyssa's choices, at least some good had come from our relationship in the son we both adored. That was what mattered most now. I decided the news, while profoundly sad, didn't change anything. I returned my focus to the people here and now who needed me most. Eventually we all have to reckon with our unfinished business and make whatever amends we can. I was ready to move forward unfettered, keeping only the hard-won lessons. Part 9. Full Circle It's surreal to reflect back on the tumultuous events that defined my thirties. Catching Alyssa's affair, our contentious divorce, her bombshell cancer diagnosis. So much has happened since that feels like several lifetimes ago. My son Liam is now flourishing in college across the country. We talk frequently, and he still comes home for holidays, but increasingly our relationship is transforming to more of a friendship between adults. I miss the hands-on fathering, but I'm so proud of the remarkable young man he's become. After losing Alyssa, 
I never imagined I'd find love again. But a passionate romance took me by surprise when Becca, that witty colleague I initially befriended, evolved into so much more. We've built a rich life together these past 15 years and raised a daughter named Mia who lights up our world. My career fortunes have ebbed and flowed through the years. I was let go in recession, started my own company that failed, and now have settled contentedly into semi-retirement, keeping busy consulting on my own terms. The ups and downs instilled resilience to persevere through adversity. I wish I could say that time healed every old wound, leaving no lingering scars. But the truth is, the deep betrayals I endured in my youth shaped who I came at a cellular level. An undercurrent of mistrust endures when people get too close. I treasure those precious few whose steadfast loyalty has earned my full faith. For others, a cautionary distance remains that may never fully close. But that is okay. We all carry our battle wounds and must learn to accept the imperfections that make us beautifully human. I try not to dwell on past darkness, keeping perspective through mindfulness and daily gratitude for the present gifts in my life. Framing my trauma as fuel for growth has given it redemptive purpose. Though life continues surprising me with its unpredictable twists and turns, I ride each wave with openness, wisdom and humour that comes from living fully. The wide-eyed wonder Liam and Mia view the world with reminds me that, despite its heartaches, life is still an awe-inspiring adventure. At the end of the day, happiness is a mindset and choice, not circumstantial. And my deepest relationships matter far more than any professional or material success. What fulfills me now likely would have sounded boring to my younger, restless self. But I've realized contentment isn't found grandly on some distant horizon. It's woven into the fabric of ordinary days spent immersed in the things that feed your soul. For me, that's time with my family, simple comforts like morning coffee on the patio, watching birds build nests in my garden and reading novels that transport me to other worlds. It's getting lost in cooking, volunteering with rescue animals, and having deep conversations with old friends. Of course, I still get restless, impatient for the next chapter, or occasional pangs of loneliness missing how full my nest once was. But then I remind myself that right now, in this moment, I have everything I need. My journey has taken me full circle. The hungry, striving youth who so desperately sought status, adventure and validation has found peace in subtle pleasures. Though life constantly reinvents itself, my real touchstones remain steady, faith, loving relationships, nature and creativity. Perhaps the most valuable thing my trials have taught me is that I alone get to define my happiness, not external measures of success. Joy is not contingent on fortune or the absence of sorrow. Rather, it is daily choosing to see the beauty surrounding me if I stop to look.